Simon Cohen, welcome to Property Insights, mate. Thank you. Thanks very much for coming in. Good to be here. Buyer's agent. Tell yes. me about buyer's agents. What's the deal? Like, you know, 20 years ago, I never heard of such a thing. Well, all we got is beaten up by the vendor's agents. So uh, if you're a buyer, so how's it all work? Yeah, this has taken me 13 years to, uh, to convince people that, you know, it's needed. But we're, we're pretty much... I guess the representative for the buyer. If you're looking to buy, we go out and we find everything on market, off market, and then we negotiate the best price. So we work for the buyer against the seller. But you worked as a vendor's agent at Ray Whitewell, didn't you? I did, five yeah. years. Yeah, so you're, what, what, how did you see the light or what the hell happened? I mean, what, why did you decide to change up? You nailed it there when you said, how did you see the light? You know, I was a real estate agent for a long time. I enjoyed it. Um, and, and I sort of naturally was working with buyers. Um, but I could only sell them the stuff that, that my office had, right? And I thought, what about all this other stock that's out there that they're not getting access to? Um, a lot of them were getting taken for a ride, they were overpaying. And I thought there needed to be some, some, some business model that represented buyers. And so I went to live in the US for a while. 80% uh, of people use buyers agents over Is there. That right? um, and I bought the model back to Australia, changed it a little bit, sort of combined with this passion I had to create, I guess, a, a culture in an office where, you know, I wanted to work if, if I worked somewhere and those two things sort of created Cohen Handler. So uh, how did the, your mates at uh, Ray White uh, take it when you said, listen, I'm going, I'm, go I'm going to go into the dark side, I'm, I'm going to leave you guys and uh, keep you honest? Look, they were very supportive. I think, you know, how did everyone take it? They thought I was a nuts. I mean, I was, I was leaving a job where at a young age I was earning really good money to start a business that no one had ever heard of in the height of the GFC. And so all those things combined, um, my own dad said I was nuts, you know? But um, they supported me and, you know, Ray White Double Bay, I've done hundreds and hundreds of million dollars worth of deals since then. So it's been a good partnership. So Cohen Handler, which is the name of your business, yep. um, is a national buyer's agent's business? Is it, you, you operating in most, Metros in Australia? Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and Perth. Okay, East Coast, West, East Coast, West Coast. You don't do Adelaide? Not yet. Or ACT? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, so, but, so you know, you have a very big base. That's a big base. Um, you have, is it, do you, do you run franchise, franchises out of those places or do you actually have their, your offices? No, they're company owned. They're company owned. So you have the office in Melbourne, Brisbane, Sydney, uh, <laughs> Melbourne, Brisbane, Sydney and uh, uh, Perth. Perth. You're right. And... How many years did you say you've been doing? 13 years? It's 2009. Okay, that's 13 years. And in 13 year period, how, over that period, how long did it sort of take for you to actually take off and so make enough money to sort of pay your way? Make it make, so it made sense, you know what I mean? Why the fuck am I doing this? Um, I'd say after two years. So you started to make it enough coin to make it w worthwhile, well, this is worth hanging in there because I can see some big upside in it. Well, I think after two years, we started hiring people and we started seeing growth. You know, in the first two years, we, we made money in that we got by, certainly wasn't life-changing money, but after two years, it, it started to grow. We started to hire people, you know? You get that, that, that feeling that, that, you know, if you own a business you love, people are there, they're earning their income from you, they're growing, you know? That's when things started to happen. So how do you build your brand? I mean, how did you tell everybody, come and see me, because I'm gonna look after you if you're a buyer. And you know, you gotta pay me a fee. If I'm successful, we pay me a fee. Um, but how did you tell everybody about you? And how did you build acceptance? The first few clients we had were clients of mine from when I was a selling agent. And they were the people I begged and pleaded to give me a chance. Um, and hats off to them. They did. One of them has been a client of mine for 13 years. I think I bought him seven properties since, but it was literally just proving our value. You know, the first house we ever bought was asking 6.6 .6 million. We bought it for 4.4. When that happened, people started talking, right? And so we started with very little money. Our whole business, including our website, everything was started on $5,000. So we didn't have money to market or anything like that. So we, we went to sort of word of mouth marketing, you know, prove ourselves, do the deals, people would talk, and then it started to snowball. Do, do, you, do you think you got your experience as to how to manage a vendor, probably more important how to manage the vendor's agent, Yeah. by being a vendor's agent? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think from negotiating for so long and 
working with people and, and learning how to read people, I, I got a lot of experience there. Because like it, it sort of doesn't make a lot of sense when a vendor's agent says, look, this property's worth five. What was the example you said before? How much was we it? We bought it, it was asking six, six, we bought it for okay. four, four. So the vendor's agent comes and says, we want six, my client wants 6.6 .6 for this property and blah, blah. Um, and then you go and buy it for 4.4. .4. I mean, how do you convince the other side, the dude on the other side, the vendor's agent that it's worth 4.4? .4? I think it's about convincing him or her and the seller, and it's arming them with information. You know, I, I like to think when you're negotiating, you can't argue with facts. And I almost look at my job kind of like being a lawyer in a courtroom. You've got to put together a compelling case of facts as to why 4.4 is a good offer. You know, it was also the GFC we were able to use the economy and the world to our advantage. Um, and I think it's all of those factors. Yeah. So, like, so you build a case. The world's going to turn to shit. Basically, um, you know, I mean, this is the case you have to build during the GFC, perhaps, to get different. Yep. 6.6 .6 before 4.4 is a big drop, okay? 10 properties that are come on the market that compare with this, you know, a whole bunch of things could be. So you build a case. Yeah. And the case is based on your own investigations. So you yep. have to go into investigations in the area, in the street. You have to do a macroeconomic view of the world, perhaps, t particularly a national view of Australia, then a metropolitan view of Sydney, if it wasn't Sydney. Um, and then you have to back it up, not only you have to back it up, you have to back it, back it up with logic and say, you're better off selling 4.4 now because you It'll might be get less. 3.8 in three months time. Yeah, okay. That's not an easy thing to do. Well, you make it sound a lot harder than it is because if you're a good buyer's agent and you're a buyer's agent that specializes in an area, call it the Eastern suburbs of Sydney, you'll be in, you'll be living and breathing that marketplace all day, every day anyway, right? Well, you, how do you do that? How you've got to all the open for inspections, all the auctions, right? You're talking to all the agents. So you know what's being listed, you know what's being sold, you know what's passing in, right? You know what's coming up. You don't have to be, I'm far from a rocket scientist, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to do that stuff, right? And so when you're doing this every day, you're getting the macro and the micro- But you're a property scientist. All together. You're a property scientist. If that's what you want to call me, I'll take it, but I don't know. Well, there's science, there's logic. There's science and logic. And there's mathematics. It's actually a, a good one. I might start using that. You can, it's free. Um, thank you. Um, Thanks for coming on the show. And so you, 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 you learn all this stuff anyway, right? And then if you're dealing at the level I'm dealing at with clients who are as smart as I am, you get to talk to them and understand from their perspective what's happening in the world. And so you combine those two things together. You know, you can read the newspaper, it's not hard to put a compelling case together if you know your market. I think you'd be modest. As well as you should. I think you'd be modest. So, uh, I, I don't think it's a, I think you're a good talker, which is, you know, your mate Gavin, he's the same, Rubenstein, he's a good talker, but you can be a good talker, you can talk shit. You could be a good talker with good information. You've got to be a good talker with a compelling and, author and an authoritative and a persuasive story to tell, which the, you guys have developed these processes, you and Gavin and there's lots of you have done the same thing. But it is about being in the swim. In other words, you know what's going on. So Simon Cohen puts himself in the swim every single day of the week, probably seven days a week. Of probably course. go to functions at night. They're probably making phone calls. You're not just sort of, uh, you know, sort of just rubbing shoulders of people, you are actually in it. You have to live and breathe it, it's a lifestyle. Yeah, it's a life, correct, it's a lifestyle. It's, it's not a job. T t totally lifestyle. What would be a typical thing you do every week just to make sure you got your finger on the pulse? I'm just out, honestly out in my marketplace. Um, every week I'm out in my marketplace seeing what is listing and selling and who is there. There's so much you can tell by going on open for inspection, right? If it's buzzing with people, you know it's a property that's that's probably going to get a high price. If it's an empty open, you know you can feel a price reduction coming. You know the doing, pressure and the sweat. On it's the great. Vehicle. You you love you love an open where there's no buyers, right? Um, th those are the things. I mean, I'm lucky where I have an office and a team of a lot of people. Every Tuesday in our sales meeting, feedback. I get to run through the room and say, Hey, Tim, what's happening in the inner west? Hey, Tom, what's happening in the north? You know, hey Joe, what, what's happening in Newcastle? You just bought something there. And so I can get this sort of feedback on stuff that's happening all over the country just from my team. Um, and so for me, every week that information is key because I can talk to my clients the way you just said it with conviction.
So that's every Tuesday? Every Tuesday. We had it this morning. Okay. Good. Tell me, where are the opens that are no one's turning up because I might be interested in buying? To, but where are you? Uh, Sydney, Let me Melbourne, get my office to send you an agency agreement. And <laughs> <laughs> no, but what, no, what's going on out there? Like, is, um, there, is, it, there, is there pressure anywhere to it's, vendors? It's, it's actually weird, right? You know, you can take a two-bedroom unit in Bondi and you can go to 50% of auction, uh, opens and they're dead, right? The other 50, they're selling 10, 20% above Why? reserve. What the hell? The good properties are selling. The properties with warts, they're hanging around. Right. And you know that's the thing about property, as you know, you buy the right property to start with, it'll always, it'll always appreciate. The ones that have issues, hundred stairs to the front door, that sort of stuff, they're not flying out the door anymore. That's interesting. So, anymore? You said anymore. I want to underline that word. During the COVID escalation, you know, when things were going mental with property. Everything was silly. Mate, Ronald McDonald could have whacked on a suit, stood at a door where mountain goats could live and sell it for 30% over reserve. Like so that was just last year. In the rising tide, every boat floats. But now we're seeing the tide go out and only the high quality you know, vessels, the high quality properties are gonna maintain themselves. So I think what you're saying is, um, on the example we gave the Bondi, um, good properties are always gonna sell. Maybe not for 30% premium, but they'll sell. You know, a property last week in Rose Bay sold two years ago for 8450000 At the time, it sold for huge money, right? It was probably worth 7.6. In the two years since they bought it, they haven't touched the house. It's still identical. It sold two weeks ago, two years later, for $13.5 million. Um, there are anomalies. You know, the top end of the market's very strong. What about the middle end of the market? Let's pick Brisbane, yep. for example. My um, second biggest office, so know it well. Okay, right. Up. So, is Brisbane experiencing? What is Brisbane experiencing? Brisbane's still quite strong. If you know, I opened an office in Brisbane six years ago, and I used to go to the one shitty hotel there, the one shitty restaurant, the house, the places we were buying were four hundred thousand to a million if we were lucky, right? I now look at the deals. Our office are doing and they're like four five six seven eight nine million dollars prices have increased dramatically in the high end um the medium end's strong there i think the low end anywhere anywhere where there's competition the moor parks of sydney the high-rise areas of brisbane the south banks of melbourne right they're the areas that are going to suffer the most because there'll be more competition for ones that are for sale, for ones that are rent, and that's where the prices will drop dramatically. So if I was to say to you, look, I'm really interested in buying Brisbane because I like the net migration from Victoria and New South Wales to Brisbane, in particular Victoria. Um, I love the weather up there. Um, I don't need to operate out of Sydney anymore. I can operate out of Brisbane. Um, but I, I want to spend a million and a half dollars. Um, would you give me some general view what I'll end up with? Yeah, I mean, my general view would be speak to the experts in my office because I'm not a local expert on the ground. But the closer you can get to the new farms and the ascots, you know, the blue chip areas, like you'll get a killer two bed, two bath parking and views if you're happy to live in an apartment. Um, if you want a house, you're just going to have to go further away from the city. Yeah, so that in, in Brisbane now. In Brisbane. Yeah, yeah. So if I was trying to build an investment portfolio with like, and I don't want to live there, um, I just an investment portfolio, would you say I should be buying apartments uh, to rent or I should be buying houses to rent? I'd buy land, house. House Brisbane. with land, Yeah. house with land. Sydney's different, but Brisbane I'd buy house with land. Yeah, why is Sydney different? Because housing is so expensive here, more and more people are happy to live in apartments and apartment living is more, um, more recognised, more everyday here, where in Brisbane, so in Sydney, you'll sell your massive house and downsize to an apartment. Like that's the thing to do. That happens less in Brisbane, if that, if that sort of right. makes sense. Yeah, yeah, so. People like the, stay in houses longer there. They buy houses sooner. Here we start in apartments and we end in apartments typically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so if I go flip over to Perth, um, would that be even more acute? Because Perth's houses. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, I was there two weeks ago, everything's houses. Yeah, and, and how is Perth going? I heard, because I, ha I have spoken to a couple of valuers and they reckon Perth's on fire. 
relative to everywhere else in Australia, that is. Um, funny. I met lots of real estate agents when I was there on my road show. Vendor agents. It, vendor agents. And they all reckon the market softened a bit. Days on market have blown out. Um, things, are, things are taking longer to sell. So days on market meaning the number of days a vendor has advertised a property for sale. From listing to selling, yeah. Yeah, but probably prior to this conversation then, maybe because it was probably selling straight away. They, they were ta probably taking maybe four weeks. Now, they, some of them told me they could stay at houses for three to six months. Like that's unheard of here. Yeah, totally. So if, if I was, I, I want to talk to you about the, the TV show, by the way, Lux, Lux Listings, because I, I, I think it's a brilliant way to build a brand. I mean, it's a great way to build a brand. But what is Lux Listings about? What's, you, you know, I mean, it's good for you because it builds your brand oh. and helps you with, uh, you know, becoming a handler and it probably helps you recruit people and uh, probably helps you get buyers to come to you. Uh, but what is the show about? What's it really about? The show is, is just showcasing Sydney's, especially its eastern suburbs and top ends housing market. I mean, the property market in Sydney, it is one of the most fascinating and high paced and exciting real estate markets in the world. Is that right? Um, without question, having lived overseas, having studied property all around the world, we live in a very competitive, exciting marketplace. Uh, we go back to days on market, they're one of the quickest in Sydney than anywhere else in the world, right? Things sell in a day here. And I think, you know, Amazon saw that and they saw the three of our lives and they, they wanted to create a TV show. Somehow it became very popular. Somehow they made our lives look very exciting. And glamorous. Um, and glamorous. I saw the big poster with the, th with the three years standing yeah. beside some sort of car or something. I don't know what it was, but all looking very glamorous. It wasn't me last night in my pajamas on the couch eating Mexican, right? Uh, um, a bag of chips and a beer. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? But it's, it's, it's about the, the awesome property market in which you know, our, our city has to offer. Is it that special? Is, it, is city that special? It really is. Like properties in LA, you can, they can sit on the market for a year. It's, it's very exciting here. The competition, the speed, the prices. I mean, it's very, coupled with how beautiful Sydney is. I mean, it really yeah. is spectacular. Well, especially if they're sort of taking uh, footage of a house in Point Piper, you know, the Bang & Olufsen house perhaps overlooking Sydney Harbour and the Opera House and ships coming in and out, in and out of the oh, joint. You it's hard it. to beat. And the three of us are kind of crazy and so that makes for fun TV and you know, you're all young guys and history. girls. So who's, who's in the show between you and Gavin? Gavin, myself, Delene Lewis, and Monica too. Right, and Delene, yeah, okay. So you're the three, four agents in the show, and, uh, and you're pretty much, uh, on behalf of Amazon, highlighting the Sydney lifestyle, Sydney property market, because they're two things that go together, the lifestyle and the property market. Absolutely. Um, and how much of it is real for you like i mean i mean you said you're sitting on the lounge with the pajamas eating mexican last night. look the, the 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 show is real like everything we do amazon has a rule that everything has to be fact checkable so yeah. legally everything that happens is real um but every day isn't a suit and a shiny car and catalinas what i'm trying to say is the nice nights are the ones where you're at home just watching TV, relaxing. How good is it? That's the best. That's the nights I live for. I only have one of those this week. Um, so that's, that's what I mean when I was saying it's, you know, the, the show is very real. Every deal that happens is real. Every client's real. Every price is real. Um, being followed around by cameras for nine months was real. Yeah, it was real punished. We're not actors, so. I've, I've done it before, but I know what it's like. I know. So like, it, it, how, do other buyers that you act for or you represent, are they always like multi-millionaires though or you've got some buyers who say, oh, just buy me a million dollar apartment? Oh, mate, we buy houses from $500,000 up to $100 million, you know. It's, it's everyone looking to buy property. You yes. don't have to have a certain income. Right, so why would, let's say, somebody just starting off, a rugby league player, plays for the Roosters. Yep. I'm not big on the Roosters. Let's say this rugby league player plays for the Brisbane Broncos, and let's make it a bit different. Yep. And uh, they're on $500,000 a year. They've never bought a property before, but their agent, their manager, said you better get on the property market. 
why would he or she, it's going to be he because it's an NRL, not NRLW, why would he seek out the assistance of Cohen Handler? What's he looking to spend? He, I don't know, I guess he's got a deposit, he's been playing for two years, he's got a deposit of 500000 he's got a home loan approved by Yellow Brick Road, by the way, of, of, of a million bucks. Yep. So he can spend a million and a half. So okay. what would you be saying to him? Well, I would say he actually needs someone more than anyone else. And I'd be saying to him, this is your first property. And as you know, I don't need to tell this to you. To me, one of the most important properties you buy is your first property because it's the property that's gonna propel you up the property ladder. So many people I know have made so much wealth through buying, rebuying, selling, flipping, all of that. And so the first property he buys really needs to be one of the most important that he ever buys, right? It needs to be one that's gonna give him great capital growth, good yield if he rents it out. It's gonna have a reason to, to hold its value if, if economy crashes, it's gonna be near a village or a beach or a reason why people are gonna to wanna to buy it and, and rent it, right? So I'd be saying to him, he's gonna want someone to advise him on what the right property to buy. And then not only what the right property to buy is, but what the right price to pay is, right? Because we all know buying property comes down to what you pay for it, not what you sell it for, right? And so it's those two factors. Um, also, you know, is he gonna know where to look, what to look for? Most people buy with emotion. You don't want to buy with emotion. You want to make sure you buy with your head, right? And so I think it's all those factors that someone like that would need someone to, to guide them into buying the right property. Because also 85% of what we buy is off market. So he's missing out on a huge, huge part of the marketplace. Yeah, I was going to say that because like typically if that particular individual probably goes on realestate.com or to domain and uh, sees all oh, those properties for sale in um, uh, New Farm. Yeah, big uh, wine new farm mobile because I like the Khalil Hotel. Yep. And uh, so New Farm is a good area. So typical, I yeah. heard this the yeah. other day. And, yeah. and, and so but he's you know, he's and he says, Well that's the reason I'm gonna buy there and um, and he goes to those two those two platforms. As opposed to coming to you, um, you're saying that you might be able to buy or find properties that aren't actually listed. Well here's what'll happen. Those two things. He'll go down the way you were saying, he'll end up going to five auctions. He'll miss out on all of those five auctions because he's just going to have to be a bidder at an auction, a number. Um, his pre-approval might run out. He'll have to get pre-approved again. He'll constantly miss out. He'll then be frustrated. He'll he'll end up overpaying for something, right? If he came to us, we'd sit down and we'd talk about a strategy. Is this to live in or is it an investment, right? Where are you prepared to live? These are the top three areas we think are the best. This is what you should have and these are non-negotiables, right? Depends on the area, whether it should have parking, a balcony, whatever. And then we'd go out to the marketplace and we'd find everything that exists, on market, off market, pre-market, post-market, price reduced, whatever exists in the marketplace. We'll go and shortlist all the best properties. We'll then do all the due diligence around them, come up with a valuation, right? Come up with what it will rent for. Put a strategy in place to get it for the cheapest price possible and, and get a place a lot quicker and a lot smarter and a lot cheaper than he will on his own. That makes sense. So where do guys like you and girls like you and Delene, et cetera, where do you guys uh, learn how to negotiate this art of negotiation? Where'd you learn that from? I think two two things. I think one, you're born with it. You yeah, know, the, art of, the ability to negotiate. We're all born with different abilities. But you're looking into my eyes to try and work out how- No, because I, I, I think you got it, right? We're all born with abilities and you got to have the ability to be able to, to to sell people and to negotiate, But are you looking right? for a tell? Are you looking for my tell if I'm the vendor? Like, if I'm the vendor's agent, what are you looking there's for? There's a lot of tells. And, and it, there's no secret to it, right? Like, if, if I'm buying something off you, I wanna know what your motivation for selling is. So you might have bought something and you might be settling in four weeks and you could be schwitzing at the thought of having to get bridging finance, right? And so if my buyer can settle in four weeks, I might be able to save $250,000 of the price because of that, right? I might be buying off you and you might not have found anything and a six month settlement might be what you need, right? A release of deposit because you're, you're equity rich, you got no cash, right? Um, whatever it might be, those are the signs I'm looking for. So you're, I also learned to doing this for a long time. Yeah, yeah. But, and so your, your game though is to draw as much information out of the vendor as you possibly can. Absolutely, information's key in any negotiation. It can be, we can be talking about any industry here. What, what the other side needs is what you should use to your advantage instead of just throwing money at someone. So you've got to know, you've got to be in the know. 
So how do you extract that from a vendor's agent? Because uh, if a vendor's agent is as experienced as you are on the side, on the, on the flip side, I should say, um, then they're gonna tell you, sweet FA. I mean, why do I, t- I mean, if I'm, your, I'm, your, if I'm the vendor's agent, you're dealing with me, you're a buyer's agent, I'm a vendor's agent, I'm gonna tell you nothing. Really, Mark? Well, let me put it to you this way. One, it's having those relationships that I've built up over 13 years, but let's park that for a second. You're selling my house, it's five million bucks, you're getting 2%, it's $100,000, right? This might be controversial. That's my 100,000, that's how much I'm yep. Yeah, this might fair. be controversial. Do you really care if it's 4.9 million? I'm not gonna answer that, but yeah, I would say yes, I do care. Okay, well, you're an exception to the rule, right? So Most agents just wanna get the deal done, yeah. and so it's about arming them with that information in the case I put together, to go to their vendor and say, shit, this is a good offer. Because they have an obligation to go back to the vendor anyway. Of course. I, so you, you put to me, listen, Mark, these are the reasons why it's only worth 4.8. Yep. We're going to offer. We're looking at four other properties, which is which is true, yeah, 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 yeah. right? So I've got an open obligation. I'm going to go back to my purchase, my buyer, my vendor, I should say, and I'm going to say, "Okay, vendor, um, Mr. V, um, these buyers are offering four point eight, and these are the reasons. And this is why I can't get any more for you. Uh, and he's not. And, and, and <laughs> that's right. And Simon's not going to pay me a dollar more. And he's offering a quick settlement, so you can have the cash in four weeks. Yeah. What do you want to do? So really, it's sort of. Um, the vendor, depending on the marketplace, if it's a buyer's market or a vendor's market or a seller's market, and which is probably starting to change at the moment, but if that's the case, then I really don't have a discussion as the agent for the bo- vendor because all I can do is say, listen, mate, that's the best offer I got on the table. These are the reasons why it's worth 4.8. They're not going to pay another dollar. They can settle pretty quickly. Up to you. Yeah, we can wait, right? And you cannot sell your house for eight more months or we can take the offer. Yeah, so do, do you not pressure them, but do you sort of load them, say, you know, why haven't you done the deal? Because if you don't hurry up and give me an answer back, I'm gonna, we've got another property we're gonna look to at. To be honest, whatever I do, I do with conviction and fact. If I say the offer expires at 5 p.m., it expires at 5 p.m., the worst part about negotiation is if you constantly say our offer expires at 5 p.m. and they call you at 6 p.m. and you're still there, they're never gonna believe you next time, right? So whatever you throw at them, has to stick. So I'd love to know, I mean, given that you're in the marketplace, been around for a long time, what, sh- what was your very first experience of buying property? Well, you're, actually, you're actually gonna know this because it's what we were talking about before. It was in McLaughlin Avenue, Rushcutters Bay. I was working as a sales agent at the time and it was a brand new building off the plan and I bought it. And um, it, was, it was an amazing 150 square meter, two bed, two bath, lock up garage in Rushcutters Bay. It had all the, the trimmings of what made a great apartment. I stupidly sold it when I started Cohen Handler and the GFC hit because I freaked out, which I should never have done because I could sell it for double today what I bought it for. But it was, uh, it was a two better in Rushcutters Bay just down the road here. I think I know the building. Ad banks. Yeah, I know yeah. the building, yeah. They did the whole lot, everything. Oh, uh, I was the first person to move into that building. Wow. It's a, it's a pretty good, that's across the road from the boys, boys uh, playing over there. Yeah, 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 exactly. I know the one. So that was it. Should never have sold. Biggest regret I've ever had, selling anything I've ever bought. Well, my old man's Greek and uh, he says never sell real estate. Yeah, he's smart. Buy and hold. I'll never sell again. I reckon it'd be a scary um, negotiation with you. It's very kind of you, but uh, no, it's not. It'd be, it'd be scary um, because I'd feel as though I was going with my tail between my legs every time I went back to my vendor because you're going to present me with all the facts that probably I already know, but I did want to tell my vendor. Of course. I, everyone knows what, what something's worth. It's just whether an agent's prepared to be honest with them at the beginning, the middle, or the end. Hmm. Usually it's at the end. 99% of the time it's at the end. So it's about you bringing forward the conditioning of the market or the conditioning of the vendor. Conditioning them quicker. Yeah, faster on behalf of your your client and then moving on if there's no deal. Correct. Simon Cohen, this has been fantastic. Thanks very much, I really appreciate, by the way, your honesty and just dropping it on the table. My pleasure. really cool. I look forward to finding your place in Brisbane.